uh, welcome everyone. We uh, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Christina Lively. I'm the program manager for the Master of Medical Sciences and Global Health Delivery Program. And today we are presenting on, uh, we have alumni here to speak on women's health. Before I, uh, before I turn this over to Joya Mukherjee, our program director, I will say the Master of Medical Sciences and Global Health Delivery Program, it's a two-year master's degree. Um, people, uh, students come and learn about research methods, management, um, and biosocial approaches to improving global health um, worldwide. And uh, we have a series of panels this year because it is our 10th anniversary. The program was launched in 2012, and we are so happy to have, we have now 89 alumni all over the world doing amazing work. And so um, if you want more information about our program, we will be following up with email uh, to, to give you more information, the website, other information like that. But for now, what I want to do is, is again, welcome everyone and say I'm so excited to hear from these alumni and turn it over to our program director, Joya Mukherjee. Oh, I'm sorry, one more thing. Uh, the way this will work, we will have Joya give a few um, words of introduction. The three panelists will each speak for 10 minutes, and then we will have questions at the end. So if you have a question, please use the Q&A. Uh, you can put your question there at any point, but we may wait and answer them at the end, or, or panelists may type in their answer, but um, we'll use the Q&A, and again, 10 minutes each panelist, and then Q&A afterwards, and now I'll turn it over to Joya. Great. Thank you, Christina. Um, excuse me, it's really my pleasure to introduce this amazing panel of speakers and I'll introduce each of them before their talk so you remember who they are. Um, and we have three uh, strong women's health advocates and feminists um, and people who really understand that there is still a huge gap in what women can receive um, in terms of health care and dignity and respect. Um, and so as we think about global health delivery, we think about really the gaps. And in some places in the world, the chance of dying in childbirth is 100 times higher um, in a, a impoverished setting than it is in a wealthy country. I mean, there is almost nothing else that has that disparity of a hundred fold difference. Um, and so what do we need to do to do better? We need basic dignity and respect and gender equality. We need access to modern uh, reproductive health and we need safe maternity care. And all these three speakers are really working at that interface of trying to improve respect and care for women um, and the autonomy of women to make decisions about their own lives. So uh, first we will be hearing from Ifra Abdi. Ifra was one of the very first trained midwives in Somaliland. She uh, has a midwifery degree, a bachelor's in nursing and received her MMSC last year in 22. Um, she is currently um, a lead fellow at, uh, at Harvard, and she is uh, still working as a consultant for the Ministry of Health. I think they've wanted to make her minister. They wanted to make her dean, um, and she uh, will be continuing her work in her home country. Uh, she'll be talking about the research that she did at Harvard assessing the different factors that led to poor maternal outcomes in Somaliland. So Ifra, I'll turn it over to you and you have 10 minutes. Thank you so much, um, Joy, and thank you everyone. I hope everybody hears me well. Um, um, I'm gonna start with the research I have um, done while I was in the master's program, which was assessing factors that impact maternal health outcomes in Morodice region, which is in the city of Somaliland. Um, before I did my research, I was um, just doing a regular um, working in a maternity ward, and I didn't know how much um, the mortality rate was outside um, in, in my field. Um, let me start with, um, um, next, please. Yes, um, I did my research 
in Somaliland. I'm from Somaliland. Um, our population is about 5.7 million. Um, maternal mortality ratio is 692 um, per 100,000. Um, there was a Somali um, demographic survey that has been done um, two years ago, and it was 396 per 100,000. Um, Somalia is a special um, case. It's um, not recognized around the world, so our, our resources are very limited, um, including the maternal health. Next. Um, I have um, the goal of what I was doing was assessing factors that impact maternal health comes, reducing maternal mortality, mortality rate. Um, the location was a certain, um, in the Marudija region, and the time that I was collecting data was from July till December. Here is the conceptual framework that has. Um, this is the conceptual framework that we followed um, during our research, which was the social um, demographic disparities, social economic burden, cultural health workforce. So we were um, looking through all this while assessing um, the outcomes of maternal mortality. Next, please. Our, I did a convergent um, methodology, convergent design, which was qualitative and qualitative. Um, we did the analysis together, emerging, comparing and contrasting the um, outcome and did the interpretation. So I did 202 women, um, each one was one hour and I did um, qualitatively and first um, interview that, that took 60 to um, 90 minutes for 18 women. Also we did ethnographic observations for three participants that last for six hours. Next, please. Um, this was the result of the um, quantitative part of my research, which was very alarming. Um, according to the number that I took um, and I um, interviewed or I um, did the survey on 83% of the women that I've been interviewed was in the city. Only 11% of those women have antenatal care visit. And um, the other number was only 6% of those women had their HIV um, status um, checked, although WHO recommended that every woman should have that tested before um, they deliver. Um, the, the other um, very alarming one was the PPH or postpartum hemorrhage was 67% out of 100, which was a very, very high um, number that comes up. Next, please. Here was the leading um, complications of maternal health, which was infection was 37%, postpartum hemorrhage, 41%, and hypertensive disorders, 2%. The reason hypertensive was 2% um, was no one take any medications very before or after they deliver. So that number, most of, um, um, the participant or or patients could not answer or give me a right answer on two percent. But as I'm doing another research around the regions, almost fifty percent of those um, of the women that delivered within the past two years had hypertensive disorders or preeclampsia. This is the breakdown of maternal health complications. BPH, as you said, was very high. Next, please. On my qualitative findings, um, there was emerging four teams that came out, which was barrier to access maternal health service, relationship and accompaniment, lack of autonomy and complications. Um, next, please. I did a perceptual method. Where we explored the woman's journey, assessing women's socioeconomic impact of maternal health, exploring structural barriers, limited their access. Um, the, the interview took 60 to 90 um, in depth. Um, 
interview for 20 women and ethnography observations. We record notes on participant observations, explore journey of care, understand social impact on maternal health outcome. Next, please. Um, this is one of um, the ethnography observations that I did while visiting homes. Um, this is, um, I want to mention this, and I, and I, I always do it um, going through the, when I'm um, seeing these pictures was um, with Boa Farmer called um, Better Solidarity, which is meaning that poor and their interest should always be the top priority in all our efforts. And going to their homes, I've seen um, the actual um, problems or what they have um, in, in my own eyes, which were, I couldn't do it um, if they came to the clinic. I wanna thank Paul for um, teaching us that. Next. Um, our conclusion came out on systemic barriers and practices in public health facility in Hargisa, um, honoring women's voices, allowing to guard, reflect, and motivate the journey of health seeking um, behavior, health system strengthening by having stuff, space and stuff and system that help address women's healthcare needs. Um, and there should be a future studies um, to see effectiveness on clinic public health interventions, which I started and um, as the next slide, please, that comes. Yes. So here's, um, I recommended a future studies. Um, I wanna explain a, a little bit about this slide, which is uh, when I came back after my research, I went straight to the Minister of Health and demand them to um, look at my research and see the numbers or alarming numbers that came up um, from my research. And um, after they reviewed, they, they approved for me to expand my research throughout the regions of Somaliland with the help of um, TED, which is an international NGO from UK. So we're doing a feasibility study um, to explore maternal health outcomes around the regions. Um, maternal mortality has been um, fifth, the it became the fifth of one of the highest in the world to expand in, um, sorry, the Minister of Health, uh, the Health and Development of Somaliland, are def they want to identify the reasons to under underutilize the optimum level of maternal health care outcomes. So we are in a process of doing that, doing that throughout the regions and expanding um, uh, my research, which was, um, I, I, I wanna uh, thank my mentors, Joy and everyone that took part of it. Our research has moved on through other country, which was um, one of my uh, dreams that I, I wanted to do in, um, after finishing um, the master's and it became true. So um, I, I, I wanna say thank you. And I'll, I will share after when the results come. So here are- Okay, Ifra, you have about a minute or two left. Um, so this is my last slide. Okay, um, So here is the um, some of um, my colleagues and data collections. So as you see before I did only women's, I'm collecting data um, from women and exploring their journey of care. But this time, I we included and invited men to see how they can help their wives or like their women sisters, mothers, like to get the care they need. And actually, the my expectations or what I was expecting before I did the research, and after I get their um, answer was way different. Like I was. Um, in my research, there was lack of autonomy was there, but now I've seen so many men um, encouraging their women to go to the healthcare and um, wanted for them to even to sign themselves uh, if there is any emergency uh, cases, which was um, in when I was doing the data collection, they were all saying no, but I can see now the difference that's shifting. Men want to take part of the, um, the care of women so the maternal mortality goes down. And um, that's about it. Thanks so much, Ifra. Okay, thank you, Ifra. That was fantastic and you know, really exciting to hear that your work will be extended throughout Somaliland. And you know, obviously the point of doing the work 
is to really change the reality for women. And I know that you'll be in a position to do that. So it's very exciting. Um, next, we have Dr. Christoph Millian, who received his master's in medical science and global health delivery in, in uh, 2020. Uh, Dr. Millian uh, serves as the um, chief medical officer for the Mirbelay University Hospital, which is a 350 bed teaching hospital in central Haiti that's um, run by Zami La Sante. Um, and he also is an OBGYN uh, who has been uh, working in Haiti for uh, his whole life, but for more than 20 years. So Christoph. And you're muted. Oh, there you go. Okay, thank you so much, Joya. And I'm really happy to be a part of this wonderful panel composed by my beloved professor, Dr. Joya, and my two beloved classmates, Yasa and Ifa. And for this presentation, now we talk about the application of pragmatic solidarity in reproductive health. And, oh, it's not, next. And the objectives of this presentation, we're gonna look at a little bit the story of reproductive health at HRM. We're gonna look at the interventions in reproductive health. And also we're gonna look at the implication of social medicine of that. And the story is that in 1984, and we start an organization, a little organization now, which is become a worldwide organization called Partners in Health and PIH. And it was started by a visionary guy called Paul Farmer, my beloved professor. And I who pass away, who pass, who passed away a, a year ago. I will never forget him. And after that, starting with the with the care and change, and we we observe a growing number of patients uh, who are coming to the hospital, and quickly after, and Kenz became one of the most frequented hospital in the country, and. After that, they scale up the health and uh, the healthcare in many facilities in Central Plaza and Atibonit. And after that, and an important event happened in 2010, where the earthquake broke in the Haitian health system, and we observed that uh, the health facilities were collapsed. And also, we observe also many healthcare healthcare providers died, and because of that, and. Because of that, the state government asked PIH under the leadership of Paul Farmer to build the to build Mirbalay University Hospital. And the hospital was built in 2000, was inaugurated in 2012. And it, as we said, it's a 200 bed hospital with many services, ICU, emergency, et cetera. And we have six residency programs including a nurse anesthetic program. And the OBGYN ward only represent, represent a one third of the hospital. And we have the first four year residency program in OBGYN. And it is the first hospital in the country which separated the conjoint twin. And our activities at Mimbala University Hospital are divided in two categories. And institutional activities where we, where we do research, teaching and service delivery and community activities which is which are connected to the hospital where we do mobile clinics community visits and also an education for the community and vaccine and our models is the PIH model as we are part of this wonderful PIH family and it's a it's 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 taking into account you know staff or many you know trying to provide human resources available for taking care of a patient and trying to provide to provide equipment and materials, medicine to take care of patients and creating infrastructure to take care of patients and also developing the health system by training a new generation of healthcare providers and leaders and also by creating by providing protocols procedures to take care of our patient and one an important characteristic of our work is the social support part which is very important and 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 all the activities and we provide these different services prenatal care family planning colposcopy and so on and 
And one important initiative, in, an innovative initiative that we have been taking is the initiation of group prenatal care, which is revolutionized the healthcare, the prenatal care and the, and the, and the network. And we observe an important achievement. 96% of our pregnant women who are part of group care delivered at the hospital. And we also provide family support and social support for 70% of uh, members who are participating in group care. And also we provide home visit for more than half of the pregnant women who are involved in group care. And also, we also provide family planning with a institutional and co community component. And you can see one important attitude. This is our modern methods that we deliver to, to women and family planning. And the second figure show you and how the long acting contraceptive method that we deliver to women. And you can see the uh, implants are the most frequent lock method that we use. And also, you can see also the tube ligation is the second frequent most frequent lack method that we provide to women which help them to you know to 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 improve the the quality of life in the family because by spacing the the birth by 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 doing birth controls and at the hospital the women have department we have many hospitalization thousands of hospitalization and you can see the most frequent cause of hospitalization at the hospital is preeclampsia and you understand also the implication of that in terms of social medicine and you we we you can see in terms of deliveries and birth life and you have for example significant improve and significant increase between 2013 to 2022 we where we have 84 percent of increase in terms of delivery in terms of c-section 90 77 percent of increase and in terms of live birth we observe 70 percent of increase compared to 2013 when we opened the obituary noir compared to now and also you can also look at you know our rate of c-section is 29 and also the rate of prematurity is 24 and you can understand the level of cost and that's what the the the, the cost that 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 start bring to us, and which is you know a, an example, a typical example, typical example of pragmatic solidarity. And in gynecology consultations, you can see we have thousands of gynecology consultations. We have done thousands of gynecology consultations, and eighty percent, eighty four percent, forty eight percent of organic college consulting are, are are new, and the ancient consultation represents fifty two percent. And you can see also we have a cervical cancer screening program where we started by screening women by VIA, visual inspection by acid acetic, and 9% of positivity. And also you can see other services that we delivered in terms of uh, cervical cancer treatment and screening. And PAP tests called poscopy, LIP, and cryotherapy, all of them are delivered at the hospital. And major gynecologic interventions at the hospital, we, we, we we did all many gynecologic surgeries at the hospital, and you can see hysterectomy represent the the biggest part of gynecologic surgery. And you can understand as well the cost, what that means, and the cost for providing you know all these surgeries at the hospital. And ultrasound also is a service that we delivered at the hospital, and we you can see you know the numbers of the number of ultrasound that we realized for our pregnant women at the hospital. And the VBG, the gender-based violence program that we have also at the hospital, and 79% nine, nine, of, our, of, our, of the case of VBG rep uh, are represented by you know, sexual violence, which is very uh, uh, an important issue in our community. And you can see in 20% are represented by physical, by physical violence and 1% and for psychological violence. And an important part of our, of our application of social medicine is teaching. We try to teach a new generation of physicians, and we arrived to put in place the, the first four-year residency program in the country. And we also improve, we, it's an accredited hospital, accredited uh, hospital by, uh, by ACGMEI. And we develop the competencies that residents would, would, would adhere to. Christoph, did we, or your sound just cut out? Oh, no, and we have, you don't hear me? 
No, now Hello? we're good. Now, we now we're back. okay. You're back. Yeah, you're we, back. Have, we have five classes of Fubidra and Doctor who got graduated. And for a total of 20 residents, uh, 20 OBGYN graduated at our program, and 80% of retention are observed. And we have four class, classes and training, actually, with 22 residents in total and training. And we developed the first fellowship in Oko at the hospital with international partnership and with um, my general hospital, International Gynecology Cancer Society, Dana Faber Cancer Institute, PIH, and we have one fellow in training. And research, and uh, we have done many quality improvement and research projects at the hospital, and 20 quality improvement projects uh, about have, have been done, and also uh, more than 40 research projects have been published locally and internationally. And these are some examples of research that we have done at the hospital during the last 10 years in, at, in, 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 in social medicine and global health. And what are the key implications of that? It's really important to mention that in teaching social medicine to healthcare providers is important to touch challenge the status quo. And it's important also to understand effective pragmatic solidarity is very critical to achieve good results. Multidisciplinarity and partnership are essential in social medicine. And this practice of social medicine requires to consider healthcare as a human right, because it's really important to mention that. Community interventions are Let's necessary. Stop, you have to about a minute. Community interventions are needed to understand the community voice and to support international healthcare delivery, institutional healthcare delivery. Research and quality improvement are necessary to build effective intervention in social medicine. Social justice and equity represent the moral base of our, of our action. While there are challenges and social political context, accreditation of our services and residency program, the viability of maintenance and biomedical equipment, financial issues, brain drain, availability of subspecialities, continue the legacy of Dr. Paul Farmer and, and, and infrastructures issue. What are the key ingredients of our effective pragmatic solidarity? First of all, it's a clear articulated vision and mission, strong motivated teamwork, honesty and humility, research and innovation, availability of biomedical equipment, medicine and materials, good partnership, good leadership, good community health system, social support, comprehensive resources, resources and good planning. These are key of our achievement. And thank you, Joya and all my panelists. And thank you, Christina, Bailey, and my two, three beloved professors from Harvard. Mary Jo, Byron, and uh, Mary Kay, and I appreciate you a lot. Thank you all who are here. Thank to Harvard for giving me this opportunity to, to, be, to be part of this wonderful panel. And I would like to finish by saying love and respect for my family who supported me all, all the time, my patients uh, from whom I have learned you know, medicine, my parents, my professors, Harvard and Haiti, my students, my residents, my colleagues, at HUM and at VIH, and fin fin finally to my community who have been suffering for many for many decades of all kinds of atrocity. And happy to have your questions and comments. Thank you. You're muted right now, Joya. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Millian. Great presentation, really linking social medicine teaching with also the burden of disease and treating the burden of disease. And, uh, you know, we're fortunate to have you at a teaching hospital um, so you can share that wisdom with, with the next generation of physicians. Um, next, we have uh, Yasa Lavala, um, who is also a midwife. Um, she graduated from the program in two, uh, 2020 with her master's in global health delivery. She is currently pursuing a degree in social work in the United States. She launched uh, and leads an organization in Liberia that's dedicated to helping women get good maternal care. Uh, she was also a Mandela fellow um, and you know, recognized for her um, really life-saving work during the Ebola pandemic uh, while she continued to deliver babies, even uh, despite the huge risks there. So Yasa. And just one quick note, Yasa, can you click slideshow at the top right? So we, the slides take up the whole 
see on the top right? Next to share, it says slideshow. I think if you click that, it'll the slides will take up the whole screen. Oops, <laughs> sorry. Oh, and you're muted. Can you see my slides? Um, now you have to share again. Oh, okay. Let me share. Great, and if you see, yeah, slideshow, that's great. Perfect, thank you so much. Oh, except you're muted again. No, still, still muted. Oops. Can you hear me? Now we can hear you, but we don't see your slides. I'm I don't know sorry. what's happening though. Let me try oh. again. Do you have the slides, Christina? You could just share do, them. No. Do you want me to? Oh, here we go. It's coming. Oh, but now she's muted again. Oh, that's so interesting. I don't know what's going on. Why is that happening? Okay, now we see your slides. So you need to just unmute. Now you're, now good. you're good. Yay. Can you, see, can you see my slides? We yes. can see your slides and we can hear you. Perfect. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity um, to my Global Health Delivery Program. I appreciate you all. And that's why I always say um, it's good to be part of a program that will always reach out to you to give back. Today, I'll be talking about Comfort Closet, promoting safe, skill, and dignified health facility delivery in Liberia. So how it all started. Why um, at the Global Health Delivery Program at Harvard, I was given an opportunity to do a research in 2020 without any knowledge of research, not knowing where to start my research from. I had a dedicated team that worked with me to design my research and help me complete my entire research. And why doing my research, something stood up for me. When I, at one of my research locations, I saw this um, posted on the wall, I, on the walls, I, one of the public health facilities in Liberia. I saw no money business, all services free of charge. And I saw this poster of, of my um, materials pregnant women needed for delivery. While going through my research and collecting data, I also figured out these were actually one of the reasons why most women were staying home and not going to the facility to give birth because my research was trying to understand um, the different experiences pregnant women um, have had with using the health facilities in Liberia. So this stood out for me as one of my research findings that pregnant women were staying home giving birth because a lot of them could not afford these materials, especially pregnant women in the rural areas. And the issue of trust also stood out. The issue of trust came out that pregnant women have more trust in the trained traditional midwives rather than the skilled health facilities and skilled midwives. And our findings were based on the fact that we talked to pregnant women, we talked to traditional midwives, we talked to skilled midwives, and after all the data collection, this was one of my research locations as well, which I did um, an observation there. I, I, I was there with them, spent some days with them and did some observations after the research. And so I decided to do something about my findings, even though that was not part of the plan of my research, but being someone who have worked across Liberia for all those years and doing this research at Harvard with all the findings, I decided to do something, establishing comfort closets. So if you look at these pictures, these are babies who were, who were born without the basic supplies. Their, mom, their, their moms could not afford to get those um, basic materials like the blankets, the hat, the diapers and everything. So if you see here, you see them wrapped just in a piece of lap, what we call lapa in Liberia. And it is a serious issue because the, these mothers who will be accepted in the facility to give birth, they will have to pay for whatever materials that, that were used for them. So I decided to launch the comfort closet um, based on my findings. 
So we chose the maternal waiting home, which was one of our research locations. And they gave us a room. So that empty room, we renovated that empty room and stack it up with all the basic supplies uh, a pregnant woman needs to give birth. So each of the bags, if you look here, after we renovated the room, we had these bags um, that we stuck up with, diapers, sanitary pads, um, um, bleach, um, um, just the basic things they needed to give birth, blankets, baby, uh, one seeds and everything. So what's in these bags? These are the materials that we stuck up in the bag and each woman going to the maternal waiting home to give birth, we have one bag free of charge. So the maternal waiting home, where it's located, is in an area that is attached to a very big government facility, government hospital. So women who are far away from health facilities, they will come there at eight to nine months, stay there until they get in labor and then they are transported to the health facility to give birth. The goal is to prevent maternal death and be able to handle complications when they come in the hospital. So each of them at the maternal waiting home receive one of the bags. And on the day we launched the comfort closet, we had um, 28 traditional midwives. So what we did, we assigned one midwife at that waiting home as part of the pilot um, project that we are doing with the comfort closet. So that midwife uh, will escort a pregnant woman when she's in labor to the hospital, stay there with her until she gives birth, and then they bring her back to the waiting home before she can go back home. So if you see here, our midwives were with us and they were saying on their t-shirts, say no to bathroom delivery, say no to delivery in the, in the banana bush, which is something that is done in Liberia. And if you look at our impact, from May 2021 to 2022, we've had over 300 women benefiting from this program, passing through the maternal waiting home and having safe birth in the hospital. And what's striking to me, or what stood out to me, was that most of the deliveries that are coming through the maternal waiting home are all complicated delivery, majority of them leading to cesarean sections. So we are glad that our impact, we've been able to get women from the community to come to the health facility receiving these bags. And one of the things that the midwife told me was the bags are actually encouraging more women to come to the facility because they know they will have everything they need to give birth in the hospital. Looking at these pictures with all these babies smiling in, their, in the blanket, being comfortable, it's one of the things that, that make me happy because this was my goal to ensure that every woman will have access to a safe, skilled, dignified delivery where she can be happy and hold her baby after delivery. So uh, what are some of the challenges we, um, we've had running this program? Can you still see my slides, everyone? Yes, so, we still see them. Yes. Okay. We see so them. we've had issues with collecting data because I I'm glad that I learned this um, at Harvard making use of data. We've had issues with getting the data on the usage and how the whole thing is running. And we also had issues of sustainability. Just so you know, this program was like sponsored by me, just asking friends for donation, using my birthdays um, for raising funds and asking people to help. So sustainability has been our issue, how to sustain this program. But we've been able to like restock the room after every three months based off of donations, based off of people seeing the good work we're doing and coming in to, to help. So what, what are our future plans? Moving forward, we are working on establishing two more closets. One will be at the Monrovia Central Prison in the capital of Liberia. And another one will be in another rural area called Finitoli, another maternal waiting home that serves two county in two counties in Liberia. And we are also having talks with the Ministry of Health to see if it's something that they are able to partner with us or work with us to establish at different hospitals across Liberia. So I just want to say thanks to my entire research team, um, my PR, Carol, Alain, Hannah, thanks for the qualitative skills you imparted in me, Joya, everyone, my classmates, Christiana. I want to say thank you coming to Harvard without any idea of, of, of doing a research and being able to do a research that I've led to this program that is helping a lot of women. I'm just grateful. I want to say thank you so much. And it is my hope that this program will go across Liberia and at every hospital we have a comfort closet. I'm going to stop here. I will take questions. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you so much for that. Um, you know, I, as 
anyone who's worked with me knows I, I really have a problem with the term sustainability because how can we live in a world where this basic dignity can't be sustained? We've got to figure that out, right? It can't just be up to poor women. And, you know, I remember the first time that I heard about this kind of problem was in Haiti from one of our graduates, Maxie Raymondville, and who said, you know, a lot of women don't want to deliver because they're ashamed they don't have clothes for the baby. And I thought, how can that be? They don't come to the hospital because they're ashamed. So thank you for taking on this critical, critical aspect of, you know, women's dignity. And um, I think all three of you have highlighted, you know, just so many different elements of, you know, what it will take to really close that gap of a hundredfold different uh, life, you know, uh, mortality risk for childbirth uh, among women in, in impoverished countries. Um, and so uh, we're going to open the floor to questions. Um, there's one in the chat uh, for Ifra, and then I'll wait for, for others. And, you know, thank you, Byron and Mary Jo for joining all the way from Indonesia, two of our most uh, senior and most central professors to the program. Uh, we're always grateful for your participation and support. Um, the question for Ifra: what level of the three delays model do you think is most important for tackling maternal mortality? Um, is, uh, is this something that's coming out? Of course, the delays being, you know, the delay in getting to the hospital, the delay in decision making. Um, and so what what did you find in your um, in your work that could track to those three delays? Okay. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we hear. Yeah, thank you for um, Joy and thank you for um, the question. Um, as I was um, collecting data, I find out um, more delays actually, not just the three, but uh, there was a lot of delays that I um, I'm encountered. So this um, I mean, one of the most um, important was um, there was a tra traditional birth attendance that has been uh, working for years. So, Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay. So um, mothers were trusting more to tra traditional birth attendants. So the first delay was coming um, from there. Like um, the mother reached the hospital by the time that um, she bleed or um, they could, the traditional birth attendant could not help them um, anymore. So by the time they transfer her and get a car, there is no, um, ambulance that they can call. So the first delay was um, not trusting. Um, the second one was um, the infrastructure, the how the maternal um, child centers were located far from each other and there was no direct transportation um, from their homes to, to, to the um, health facility. So that was uh, a burden for them to find um, a financial there was another financial constraints, which was the transportation. They couldn't afford going um, to the clinic either by paying um, their incentive or they have to pay certain um, money in order for them to be seen. So there was uh, like all, there was so many burdens for them to, to reach. Another one was lack of autonomy, like their um, families were not allowed, like their in-laws or You froze for a second, Ifra. Maybe turn off your video. Okay, while we're getting Ifra back, Ifra, you've frozen. Um, I just want to say that, like, the 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 three delays model, which is very interesting. What you know, what we say is, it's always all the delays, right? There's no way to look at one thing because people's lives are so complicated. And um, I I also want to say about this trust 
in the system that Ifra pointed out, the treatment of women is often so bad that it's not even that they don't trust the system. The system is very unkind and brutal to them. Um, and I'll have uh, Dr. Millian jump in and then we have a question for Yasa. Go ahead, Millian. Thank you. Thank you so much, and Prof. And what I would like to say, and before, before giving my comment, on the two delays, just a little comment about that. And I would I forget to mention one of my beloved professors, and I have been working for for you know, still continue working together. Harlin, I love you, and forget to mention your name. And I have to say that because I've been working with you so much, and we're still working on the chapter and accompaniment. I love you so much. Thank you so much. And what I would like to mention about the two delays, Joya, what you mentioned, what you said, like you said. It's 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 not a, it's not it, they present it in some paper like a linear stuff, but it's not linear because there is so many factors. For example, when you look at, for example, having money in your pocket, having food in your plate, and then could influence systematically your decision to go to the hospital. Because if you if you don't get, for example, who can't pay for transportation, for example, that could influence the, the care that you're going to have at, at the hospital. And if you can't have money in your pocket, you, you can't, for example, reach the hospital because you have family members which will be at the hospital with you and you can pay for the care. That's, it's not linear. It's really totally complex, complex merging factors that you can't separate, you know, and by each, 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 by each factors to, to say that, for example, healthcare is more important at the hospital. And then to say, for example, it's not necessary to look at, for example, the decision making to to go to the hospital. It's it's really complex. It's just what I'd like to, to add this comment about, yeah. you know, the delay. Thank you. Thank you, Christoph. And I think, you know, one of the things for those of you who are applying or not yet in the program, um, you know, one of the things we pride ourselves on in our program in global health delivery is really looking at the comprehensive value chain throughout. Um, and so Yasa, I think there was a question for you in the, the chat, um, you know, couldn't the local government and health office fund the stocking of the maternity needs? Uh, that's the question. Uh, <clears throat> thanks for that question. So when the maternal waiting home was built by Africa years back, Africa um, took care of that maternal waiting home for two years. And when they turned it over to the government, the, the, the attendance rate dropped because when Africa was funding the, the maternal waiting home, they were providing all those materials. But when the government took over, it stopped. And then the rate, the attendance rate dropped. So across Liberia, one of the reasons why you see this challenge as this thing is the fact that the government um, is, I don't know, I would say they are strained. The health um, budget is not enough to, to like provide for the health facilities. So it's, I'm not, I don't wanna say it's unrealistic. We still talk, having talks with them to see if they are able to connect out to, to some partners working within the government because the health system in Liberia depends on donor funding. Just so you know, we depend heavily on donor funding to get the health system running. So that's the reason we are still having talk with them to see if there's something they're able to do like across the country to just provide this thing and help with stocking. But as it is right now, we've had an experience where when the government was providing it, it wasn't available and, and the attendance rates dropped seriously. So that's the reason we're trying to see how we can mobilize different resources to get this going. I hope that answers yeah. the question. Thank you, Ifra. A very clear, and I, I, you know, what I would say is governments like Liberia do put a fair amount of their uh, GDP into health, but it's just insufficient. And as it is, many of the vital staff are underpaid, um, and so I think it's it's very challenging. Um, Ifra. Uh, your hand is up, so I'll let you answer. And then uh, Jonas, if you want to um, have a um, uh, jump in, we'll let we, we can open your your chat. Eddie Jonas. Uh, but go ahead, Ifra. Thank you, Choya. I um, there is a question in the chat that I was reading, and um, I, I wanted to add. Um, the answer on it about the community health workers. Um, after expanding my research to the regions, I went to different um, regions in Somaliland and 
um, there was some of the regions that there was an international um, donors or NGOs that um, help women. Um, it called ch women. Ch they were uh, community members that goes homes that um, bring women to a prenatal visit and deliver medications for free. So there are um, two of the regions that I visited. One of them did not get any help from anyone. And their um, mortality rate, like every week, there is three or four women die because of lack of care. And the other side of the country, um, where there is more help and more um, international donors or NGOs, women were getting saved. And um, those um, community health workers are called women champions, um, have minimizing a lot of mm -hmm. the yeah. problems that women have. For for coming to the clinic, so um, I, I I find out that um, it all related or it all depends on fund. Like if you have enough funds, you can change a lot. Like um, just an example of two these two places, and one of them are, um, you know, the problems are so minim so minimum, and every mother is connected to the healthcare um, clinic because of. Um, there is a, someone that she trusts um, that will take them to, to the clinic and the other one not trusting. So I, I just want to add to that. Yeah, and I think that, you know, thank you for that, Ifra. you know, that ties in with the question about sort of community health workers, which, um, you know, thank you, Tomba, for that question. Community health workers, I think, have played a role um, in these projects. Um, but often they are the trusted people. You know, it might be the traditional birth attendant. Uh, someone asked about that. So um, very good. I don't know if uh, if Byron and Mary Jo, if you wanted to ask a question live, we can open the mic for you. And I think have you opened the mic for uh, Dr. Jonas? Christina. Hey, we would do that. Let me get on. I hear you, Byron. Does Eddie want to go? Eddie, if he's on, should go ahead. He had a question. There he is, yep. Got it. So, so you can unmute. Yeah, Eddie Jonas is a first year student and also an OBGYN from Haiti and wanted to make a comment. Go ahead, Eddie. Yeah, uh, good morning, everyone, and then thanks uh, to the uh, to Dr. Christoph, Ifa, and then Yasa for uh, their amazing presentation. So I would like to ask uh, or just add a comment about what uh, uh, Ifa mentioned on her presentation related to infection and postpartum hemorrhage. When I, when I saw these uh, numbers uh, related to infection and postpartum, in, in, in postpartum hemorrhage, I was asking, so what, what's going on? Because why this is so, is so high? So by following the conversation, I can understand that something is uh, not... Uh, uh, happen very, 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 not happen very well in this uh, kind of service that the uh, patient receive at the, at the hospital. When if I mentioned that uh, the staff are very rude uh, toward the uh, the patient, so you know healthcare in the healthcare field, many things are uh, uh, go right. together. So okay. if you have a staff. Uh, very rude, disrespectful toward the, the, the patient. Uh, beside the uh, uh, the shortage, beside of lack of uh, material, anything. So the result can be uh, uh, catastrophic in terms of uh, infection and postpartum hemorrhage. So this can be um, uh, the impact of uh, some kind of behavior of uh, the staff uh, during the uh, 
uh, doing the services. I mean, when they offer the, the, the care to uh, to the patient, they if they are disrespectful, they do not listen to the to the patient. They do not uh, pay attention to uh, their complaint. They do not. Uh, uh, they they at some they, at some point they can be uh, uh, negligent. So all of that can interplay to explain why the infection rate is very high. The postpartum is more just so postpartum depression, which is. Uh, 20% can be uh, very high because when the patient feel uh, very traumatized uh, by giving birth and then uh, being treated with uh, disrespect. So all those uh, uh, factors can uh, play together to uh, yield this result. So, I understand okay. that yes something may uh may need to to be done to thank uh, you change the, the the approach one of the okay. things that i would like to to mention also uh I, this is a question for for million uh doc million my, yes, my, my, my dear brother yes my dear brother my dear friend i'm happy to hear from yes. you yes um i'm very glad to to see you uh, 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 continue to uh, the good work. So, do you uh, uh, men do you have any statistic related to the outside uh, catchment area? Because as you, I, 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 I as I like to mention, uh, PIH Haiti is a kind of oasis uh, in the. Uh, medical desert in Haiti. So we should monitor that to use it as, as something that we can need for advocacy. advocacy. So uh, we need to have those uh, statistics available. And then, yes. as it, mm. yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, doctor, All right. I'm gonna I'm gonna cut this off so we have some time. But go go ahead and answer that million. Thank you, Jonas. Yeah. Uh, just, just, just last one thing before I I, 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 I just to wrap up. So when it is difficult difficult to offer to women good quality of care, from my point of view, we can at least offer them the control of their fertility. So, yeah. Okay. We'll let you talk about that on another time. Okay. Thanks, yes. Jonas. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Jonas. This is an amazing question. And what I would like to say, at H3M, for example, we have about 50% of our, of, our, of our deliveries are coming from out of the central plateau. That means we have patients who are coming from uh, Quarebuque and 50% are coming from port au do that, and it's important questions because it gives you the deepness of what's happening in, in, in terms of you know the uh, the deepness of comprehension of social medicine. Because when you have patient, you know when you have a, health, a broken health system where people could get access to care and the cost represent the big barriers, and you can see you know where they can get it, they will make the sacrifice to reach the infrastructure who can provide them it. And this is the case for Miambale University Hospital, where many people around the country are coming here to get access to gynecologic care and also, you know, uh, emergency obstetrical care. And this is really important. And that's give you a sense, you know, the situation of the health system and also, you know, the level of suffering that women face in order to get access to care and, and all in, and, and the country. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, Millian. Um, Byron uh, and Mary Jo, I know you're listening in from Indonesia. Would you like to make a comment live? Sure, I will. Can you hear me OK? Yes, we can. Uh, lovely to see you all. Um, I feel very much at home by uh, seeing, seeing and hearing everyone. I do. I just want to say that that for each of you, for Ifra, I remember so vividly your when you were putting that the project together, and it's lovely to hear what a success it is. 
um, Yasa also similarly. And of course, Milian knows that Mary Jo and I have been following him through this whole pathway and is as in the background here. But just want to say, um, you know, congratulations to you all first. One brief story comment. 20 years ago, 25 years ago, when we came to Indonesia, Indonesia to this day still has high maternal mortality rate in what is a quite wealthy country uh, in compared with the ones that uh, most of you are talking about here. And so um, one of the questions, they had a big USAID project like 25 years ago about this. And I remember they were like finding all kinds of ways to track the women more carefully, et cetera. And I asked, we asked, Mary Jo and I asked a simple question, do people die en route or they, do they die in the emergency room? Is the problem really with the women or is, it the, or is the problem with the healthcare system? And I think that's always also. Um, actually the findings of, um, of a small project that, uh, uh, that uh, our colleague at Brandeis did was that they were dying in the emergency on the in the hospital. So there are and, there are certainly there is good evidence that care. the problem is the quality of care in the uh, in the local hospitals or in the ambulance or in the ambulances or when getting on the way on the way to so anyhow it's I just think that it's that you of course all know how unbelievably complex the process is and in certain cases you have an hour I just was talking with a woman here who had like three months ago had a had an ectopic pregnancy and would have died within hours if she weren't like right here. And so we, you all know just how complicated this process is and what a wide range of phenomena you're talking about. But it's really great, Ifra, to see you spelling out uh, the different situations and to hear from all of you. So thank you. Great. Okay, thank you so much, Ifra um, or Yasa. Actually, why don't we have Yasa um, answer that one for now because she hasn't uh, answered one in a bit. Yasa, what do you think is the, is the should the onus, should the um, responsibility be on the health system to do a better job or is it, I mean, this is a rhetorical question from Byron or is it the fault of the woman for not getting there? And I'm going to answer this question like from my own experience and from where I come from. And I think it's, it's, the, it's the responsibility of the system to provide the kind of services the people need. Um, because as we, as we always say, and the PIH model is saying, you can't do one and leave the other, right? If you are not able to provide the atmosphere, the necessary atmosphere for your people to thrive, how can they even address their own health needs, right? And we will go back to look at the social determinants because it's something that is like implanted. It's not something that people impose on themselves. These are things that build up over time. And so I think the responsibility is on the, the government, the system to actually provide the kind of services that um, the, women, the women should be receiving, trust me. When those services are made available, the women will attend the facilities. Nobody wants to sit home and, wait and see your baby die um, during a delivery. Or nobody wants to sit home and go through a complicated delivery only because maybe you want to just stay home. But the situations that they find themselves in, as Christopher was saying, you can tell a pregnant woman to take her medications when she's not even having the food to eat, when she's... Um, like out there trying to make ends meet and the economy is so bad that even the, the, the business she's doing is not going. So I think bulk of the responsibility rests on the government and the system to make available those um, services. Great. Thank, thank you, Yasa. Um, I think there's a, there was a, another question I wanted to highlight. Um, which was from Eric Krakauer to Dr. Millian. How do you prepare these residents for when they leave HUM and will go to work at a hospital where the working conditions may not be as good? 
Um, are you teaching them leadership, resiliency skills? And this is a wonderful question. And thank you, Eric, for these, Prof. Eric, for these wonderful questions. And first of all, what we are trying to, to teach to, us, to, to our residents is, you know, the, the, to understand the social context, because the social context is really key, but not to sensibilize them about, you know, what, we should, what should be the next step. The second also, it's about, you know, and how to, to, to we teach them social medicine skills, like, you know, understand the social, what we call social determinant of health, and also understand the necessity that we, the, the one important point of social medicine is about the notion of equity and social justice. And which is, you know, we're trying to incorporate some, you know, leadership skills in that to make sure that they understand that if we leave maybe not the people in the countryside without having, having access to healthcare, who will help them? And we are trying to serve as, as role models as well, because we have many people who have been working at Partners in there for, for more than 12, 10 years. Like me, I've been working for more than 12 years and, and, at this institution, and I've been working in the countryside. And just to show them it's it, and also, when we talk about role model to show you know, how can you change men and the paradigm and the statue quo is always challenging to to challenge what i what i would say but we try to sensibilize to show them that it's possible this model for example the building of mirabara university hospital the model of partners in health we have and we have shown its efficacy and also we have shown that uh, how many people that we have we have to save life and we use this model to, 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 to provide them, you know, skills to, 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 to provide them, you know, enough understanding that is necessary to, to go to the countryside to, to change the paradigm. And the example is clear. We have 80% of our physicians are working in our network and outside of our network, not in part of us, only about one or two uh, OBGYN uh, who are working outside of our network. But who are working in progress, but all of them are in PIH or something else, for example, in Grand Rivia, you know, or that's give us a sense, you know, how they really motivated to see how they can do health, they can change the health system. And also it's the same for emergency physician as well, because we have the same residency program in emergency. Now we have emergency intervention physicians who are working in our network and also outside of our network, but mostly outside of the outside of progress. But we know that the security context also is a factor that, that favor the people going to the countryside to work. But we know as well the way that we prepare them, teach them, to incorporate, you know, the the notion of healthcare as a human right, the way that we show them, we go to the community with them to show the reality, how people, the way that people, you know, live, and they understand that it's more than necessary to go to the countryside to continue to serve the poorest part of the world. And then this is what Paul told us before, and we're trying to perpetuate that. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Doc Millian. Um, I, I guess um, trying to think what else is uh, good to answer here. Uh, we've answered a lot of the questions. Um, uh, I would say here's one for each of the three of you about gender balance in providers. I didn't take this right away because it says physicians, but uh, let's let's talk about all care providers. In the three of your experiences, and we'll start with Ifra, what percentage of physicians are women? Um, is and uh, do you think that would be helpful? Um, and are women represented in maternal health? Of course. There are many, many female midwives, but Ifra, why don't you take a shot at that gender representation among the health providers and whether that makes a difference or not? I don't know how I have to go first. No, I, I was gonna have Ifra go first. Oh. Ifra. Sure. Um, hi, I think my internet is cut enough. Thank you for um, the question, Joya. Um, I just want to um, add a little bit of experience back when I was getting trained as a midwife and 
there was um, less healthcare workers back then. There was only male doctors and um, it started, women were um, going to medical school and there was like two doctors that came from abroad. So I remember um, when a woman needs a cesarean section and there is a, um, a female doctor, the um, mother says, oh no, I don't want to get um, um, operated by a woman as she was not trusting it uh, mm -hmm. back then. But the things has been changed and now actually as the, um, like seeing um, or examining all the different health workers in, in, in town or in Hargeisa, half of them are women in the hospital that I work and get trained at the hospital. Um, the surgeon is a woman, the um, OBGYN is a woman, the anesthesiology is a woman, the laboratory is a woman. And um, th there is like a huge, um, like women are getting trained more. And, and I've seen women are like coming to deliver or looking for um, female doctors, which was um, because of the culture, burden because of the religion, they prefer more women um, for them to, 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 to get contact with. So um, it, it's, it's improving now that I've seen um, lots of females around. Yeah. And I would say, you know, one of the- um, There is one of no, go ahead, go ahead. There's, there's no, not Minister of Health woman, which I'm gonna be, but um, we are yes, in that are. level of being a health worker. I, I would say, you know, and I'll, I'll let Yasa and, and Christoph weigh in as well, and then we'll wrap up this session. But one thing I would just highlight for the, the, the audience and for the person who asked that question is, there's gender, but there's also the interprofessional respect because midwives do shoulder a huge amount of burden. And yes, they're mostly women and the doctors are often mostly men, but it's also the doctor nurse respect um, that can be really uh, challenging and important to think about in, in trying to take this holistic view and even respecting the traditional midwives who may have a lot of knowledge of the community and the families themselves, the women themselves. Yasa and then Christoph, and then we'll wrap up. Um, thank you for that question, Joya, and thank you for the answer. And if I, I would just talk about my experience working back in Liberia um, in the maternal health field. I think it's different for different locations and culture also play a major role. But when it comes to gender balance, I, we have women in, in the health field that are represented. Like Joya said, the midwives in Liberia, most of the midwives are women, the skilled midwives and traditional midwives. But the thing there is, you find more doc more doctors who are male, male um, in that in that profession, and most of the times you find that the doctors will try to assert their own um, authority over the midwives. And the truth is, from where I come from, a lot of women prefer to work work with women, especially in the rural areas. A lot of women will not trust a, a male like doing their delivery or working with them. And even some of their partners were refused for a, a male to do a delivery for their wives. I had an experience where um, a, a particular tribe in my country, he would not, the husband would, would, would not allow a male doc, um, doctor to deliver his wife. They had to go through all the different cultural, um, traditional rights and all the different consultations before that. But I think there, there is actually a general representation, but as Joya said, there's an interplay of this whole interprofessional stuff. Yeah. Great, thank you. And Christoph, as the uh, mm. honorary man on this panel, what would you say to this sort of <laughs> yes, gender I'm dynamic, but also the interprofessional dynamic? Yes, and happy to be, the, to be a part of this wonderful panel of women because, you know, I'm a, Feminist, the right to have care advocate, and I would like to to mention that. And for these questions, like Yasa mentioned, and, and also Ifa, the, yeah, the cultural aspect that that is really important because, uh, for example, in Haiti, for nurse, you have more 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 women compared to men, and for doctors, you have more doctors compared to you have more men compared to women in the field of practice in the field of OBGYN. And what we are trying to do at Mirbala University Hospital is to try to, cha to challenge 
this cultural status quo, where we're trying to improve to improve the ratio of women, you know, and our residency program at Ubijuan. It's not something difficult. It's not something easy, you know. And but now it was about ten percent. Now it's close to be twenty twenty five. It's not always good, but we need to go to arrive even more women in this and in, in, in terms of ratio, women and men and Ubijuan. The second aspect, the, the the second aspect is about choice, and we need to make sure that women, you know, have the choice about choosing a man or a woman for getting access to the OBGYN care because they need to to make sure they need to 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 get this possibility and when you have a residency program and most residency program you have most of them men that's when you de you decrease this possibility of choice for women and we need to to look at this aspect the third is the notion of equity and social justice because and uh, even in in developed in the in the developed world, we observe that there is a discrepancy in terms of you know salary between men and men, and also and but in the developing world, it's not uh, it's not always discrepancy in terms of salary and 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 between, but it's about also having access to the economy, the market economy, because when and who get uh, access to OBGYN and then can get access more to more money, they can do more business. It's, a, it's an economic, you know, aspect. And we need to challenge that to make sure that, and equally, women can get access in terms in term of salary, because uh, we observe that also in the developing world, but also in the same time to improve the economic situation of women, because they need also to get access to these to this, to this, to this economic, to the what we call that, to the economic aspect of the of any society, having access to job, well-paid job, and they can make the change for themselves. And also, the third, it's about leadership. Fourthly, about leadership. And sometimes, because men are, you know, always at the top of most of the positions, and limiting the capacity of women for making decisions for themselves. And this is important to integrate women at the highest levels of position to make sure that they can, you know, make decisions for themselves. And this is what we are trying to do at HUM. For example, you have many chief of services who are who are women, and we have men also. It's close to be 50-50. This is something that we are trying to improve over time to make sure that women, you know, we respect the right of them and they get access to all things that we have in the society like men. This is my, my answer. Thank you, Christoph. Great answer. <clears throat> so, you know, I, I think we, we could talk for hours with this talented group of, of feminists and women's health advocates. And I want to thank each of you, Yasa, Ifra, and Christoph, for sharing not only your research, work, but the ongoing work you're doing to try to improve dignity and life of women. Um, and so thank you very much. And I'll just turn it over to Christina to close up the morning. Yes, once again, thank you so much, Joya. Um, thank you, panelists, um, for sharing your experiences. Joya, for your amazing leadership of this program, the Master of Medical Sciences in Global Health Delivery. I also want to thank Bailey, who is um, helps get the word out, our, our marketing and, and outreach for our program. And I wanna say thank you everyone for joining us. Our next panel will be on Friday, March 3rd and will be on tuberculosis care. And we will send a follow-up email to everyone who joined us today with more information on that um, for now. Again, thanks for joining and we'll wishing you all the best. <laughs>